What's the nature of your emergency? Welcome back to the Tactical Living Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton, joined by Detective Walton. Clint, how are you? I'm good. We are upstairs in the studio recording with the windows open. And I think right now is truly the epitome of what they say is the calm before the storm. We can see the clouds coming in and the path of Hillary. We are snap, snap dab, smack dab. Smack dab. <laughs> Snap dabs almost like that fish, the sand dab. (laughs) In the middle of it. Yeah. So it's funny. I'm seeing so much rhetoric on online about it. And for anybody not in Southern California, I think it's important to understand that we don't get much rain here. And so having an unknown that could cause, to me, the biggest danger is massive flooding, right? I think that's why everybody is kind of having this sense of urgency or panic or not knowing what to expect. Because whenever the forecast calls for rain, we always have the same interpretation of that. Like, okay, maybe we'll get a couple sprinkles. And that's because that's typically the pattern for our weather. Oh, I thought we were talking about Hillary Clinton. (laughs) (laughs) I've seen so many memes, you know, like the, it shows the flight path and you can you can click on all the dots to see what the miles per hour are. And somebody edited in her head, like, oh, like floating up the coast. And it's one of those, that meme where she's like opening her mouth and she looks like a horse. You know oh, what I'm talking geez. about? Yeah. We're not talking about that today though. <laughs> we're waiting for that today. So I just wanted to share that, but I wanted to talk about some of the hidden wounds and unmasking the subtle traumas that first responders face. So just sit back, relax and enjoy today's content. Now, I'm talking about this because we all know that there are so many incidents that first responders respond to that one might categorize as being traumatic, potentially traumatic. Even if it's not something that seems traumatic, um, it could have long lasting effects that cause things like um, there are many types of symptoms that somebody could experience in terms of a trauma response. But I wanted to talk about some of the things that are a little bit less talked about with the hidden trauma, some of the lesser um, lesser seen emotional impacts that don't always stem from the high intensity situation. So one of them is the delayed response guilt. And what I mean by that is there could be situations where an officer might arrive a few minutes too late to an emergency. And even if nobody was harmed, they might constantly like revisit that situation and wonder what could have happened in those minutes. So that's a great example is the delayed response guilt. And something else would be witnessing neglect. Clint, you see this all of the time, you know, working with abused children. So even seeing neglected or abused children or abused animals during a routine house call, the avert trauma of that might be a direct abuse, even if it doesn't seem like it. And there's hidden trauma in witnessing an environment that these kids or these animals live in. Yeah, it's something that... You, you don't always recognize, especially up front. And, you know, I've been involved in some serious, very serious cases in reference to kids being abused and killed and or severely neglected and they die. And in the the sights you see, it's it's something that you would never expect. Like you just you don't realize that the humanity that's there, like how severe people can be towards the most innocent and and that includes animal animals and kids and even elderly like it's something that you don't even recognize until you're actually in that situation and it's something that i've really noticed is is you see newer officers responding to something like that and it's something like they'll go to shooting stabbings all that stuff all the time but when you show up on scene to where you have a severely malnourished child who is three years old, but looks like an infant. That's, that's something that you just can't get out of your head, especially if you're not prepared for it. Yeah. And that's definitely one of those masked traumas that isn't unveiled until you experience or you see it. Um, another one I wanted to, to bring to the forefront is unresolved incidents. I hear a lot of dispatchers in particular discuss this, 
But first responders as a whole, there's a reason they're called first responders and not the last responders. And with that, there's this giant gap that exists in unknown. And the problem with that is our minds work on a a cycle, a loop, so to speak. And so when you have a call or let's say that you are that first person, let's say you're dispatch and you're getting um, information from the caller and it is something incredibly critical and then that's all that you know, right? Because the call goes from there to, to you, right? Like in a, a responding officer. So it's very difficult unless you have the ability to follow up on everything, which a lot of times you don't because it it's handed off, so to speak, especially if like the hospital is involved. So with that, it's it's nearly impossible to be able to complete that loop. So one would constantly try to fill in the, the gaps and make up new scenarios and new stories and then new critical incident calls like that would come along and then maybe have some kind of relation and that might alter that loop. So it's this constant cycle. And I don't think a lot of people talk about the unresolved incidents enough. Um, Another unspoken one is the verbal abuse, right? Being shouted at, harassed, cussed at, like all the things. We've all seen all the videos online that have been exacerbated over the past few years. Um, Family stress, knowing that your family worries about you. And I think that's something that we're we're pretty candid about and open in discussion. But I know it is something that a lot of officers have a hard time with. Um, cumulative loss. So, Clint, this is something in your career you've experienced an abundance of. Mm-hmm. And in in saying that, it's it's the the severity in seeing that that over over decades over over time and and seeing that loss of just human life in general and and of your partners and and whatever else it may be like it it adds up and it and it adds up like i i talk with new guys all the time and i ask them do you remember the first shooting you've gone to or your first homicide or or something like that and this is guys like six years on or i'm sorry six months on and they go, yeah, I remember my first one. I remember my first couple that I've been to. And I go, yeah, give it a couple of years. You'll forget about them. And, and it's true because you go to so many of them. You start, they start compiling together and you, you can, it's almost hard to differentiate them. Yeah. Another one I put on here is cumulative loss. And I, I singled out firefighters in particular because you know, they frequently witness the loss of property and memories of families and then just experiencing that trauma um, with and for that family on a repetitive basis, even if nobody is physically harmed. Um, first responders are routinely disheartened. So an example is a traffic officer regular dealing with aggressive drivers or the aftermath of minor accidents where children get scared or they cry. First responders feel isolated. They have everyday encounters that are frequent. Um, It's emotionally exhausting. They suffer constant burnout, even if they don't realize it. And I think, Clint, you and I are very unique. I keep saying that, but I also outlined on here constant vigilance. And I think for you, when you come home, a lot of that you're able to put your guard down and not have to worry as much. And there are many reasons for that for you and I in particular. Um, But I think it's important for us to understand that there are limits on humanity, right? It doesn't matter how much you've trained. First responders are still human. They feel sadness and anger. They feel helplessness, especially when they're faced with situations that they can't control, right? And that's resulting in things now where, especially if you don't have the backing from your admin, you could wind up with an entire police department deciding to quit all at once with absolutely zero applicants in the queue, And that's a scary place for a department to find themselves in. And I think there's so many societal expectations with first responders, right? We have like the stoic hero image. And people often think that that takes the human out of the the man or the woman behind the badge um, or the man or the woman, you know, in any uniform when it comes to being a first responder. And... I think sometimes we need to stop and recognize how some of this might have a sort of spillover effect in our everyday lives. 
Some people start to compartmentalize or they develop negative coping mechanisms, right? How many times have Clint, you and I talked to each other or talked to other people about the importance of having healthy outlets and having a supportive environment, even if that means having one single person that you can confide in and even something like peer support, right? Mm -hmm. Having a... that's the entire reason why we created the police, fire, military, and family Facebook group is to have a place where we have actual people having real conversations about things that they're, they're truly feeling. And I'm so grateful to have that because there are times where I'll get messages or I see the discussions taking place inside of the group where it's, it's obvious that this is their, their first. And for some of them, their only point of contact when it comes to healing that trauma. And of course, I'm not pointing it out to them, right? There are many conversations I see where I'm like, yeah, that's a trauma response. But I'm saying that to myself, not to them. It's not my responsibility to do that if I'm not working, you know, with them in a direct capacity in that way. So I hope that everybody who is listening to this can just have the encouragement and just the awareness for regular mental health checks. And I can understand not wanting to do that in a clinical setting if you don't want to, but even having a self-check and asking yourself, like, is there anything within my place of work that I'm bringing home that's spilling into my personal life or impacting me in a way to where, I don't know, maybe you don't want to go to those family barbecues anymore, or the thought of having the family over for Christmas dinner is daunting to you. Like just recognizing the variance in those types of feelings, I think is important. I hope you've gotten some value out of today's episode. If you have, do us a favor, drop a review, subscribe down below. And as always, know that I am sending you a long, tight hug from my home to yours.